gonna pull up the essay. In this essay, I will. I did finish it. It is 12,000 words. Yes, because if I don't just read it out, we're going to miss things. And Kiki is telling Shirley everything. And I mean everything. <laughs> there might be, there's gonna be, okay, so there's some detail she's gonna leave out. She's not gonna bother with the highwayman stuff because that did not affect her really. Um, and that did not affect, it, 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 it was not really a thing she had to worry about. Um, so, and, I, and she's gonna leave out like certain people being involved, not to, like, hide them, but because, like, it's not important to Shirley. But she's gonna tell her everything important. It... I'll show you. I'll show you. Oh, jeez. That's not what I meant. Oh, okay. That's... That's cool. This is... This is it. This is it. Yeah. Hey. She meant it when she said she was going to tell him everything or tell her everything. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Oh, Bryce is awake. Fuck <laughs> me. <laughs> HUD too? I should. I want to make my black bars part of my OBS layover. And I really should, so that I don't not see what's happening. Um, Kiki starts talking. Doesn't stop for a full two hours. I don't. We can do the HUD too. Let's do that first. Uh, what is the name of this song? The actual name of the song is uh, Rev de Fond uh, by Magnus Ludvigson, but we call it Cleo's song. <laughs> is that not her footsteps? Are those a local? I thought those were her. It must have been the local. Where is she? Wait, no. I think I hear her now. <clears throat> yeah, that's her. Yeah, I hear the metal steps. That's her. It better be her. Yeah. Hi. Ha. Huh. I hope the vet appointment went well. It did. Um, I want to start with I'm sorry. And or what? 
first for yesterday, um, I was not hiding her specifically from you. I just don't decide who knows. I also know that you don't like her, so I just don't bring her up around you if I can help it out of respect for your feelings. And I let her decide who knows and when. Because that's her right to decide. I'm also sorry for the essay I am about to read to you. <laughs> because I have a lot of explaining to do. And it's something that I, I wish at least, I still wish that you wouldn't know because the, the more you know, the more danger you're in, but I, I had to write it down because it's, <laughs> it's something that started in July, so I needed to make sure I had all of my details. Okay. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna friggin' read it because if I don't just read it, I'm gonna skip things and miss things. And I, I want to make sure you know and understand everything. Okay. Okay, um, so, uh, so in July, um, Cleo and Pez bought the lighthouse from Ursula, um, Cleo wanted it to be somewhere people could seek refuge, they could go to escape from bad things, they could be safe, um, she wanted to create, like, a safe haven for anyone. So that's why they built the fence, and they put up that gate, and they planted new flowers and new trees, and they made it really pretty, and they invited her mother and father, Lennon and Bundy. Um, and Lennon and Bundy even had their wedding there. Um, but shortly after moving in, um, this man started to harass them and he introduced himself as Norman Bones immediately after the wedding um, all the plants started to die um, like they just died there was no oh they're starting to will it's just they're dead there was no progress there was no like Oh, maybe we have a chance. No, it was just... You woke up and the bushes were dead. And the grass was dead. The next day you woke up and the trees were dead. The next day you woke up and the flowers were dead. There were... Bones. <laughs> Everywhere. Skeletons. Skulls. <laughs> there were crows. There were so many crows. And they were attacking people. Um, one of them even picked up somebody and threw them in the ocean. And that's when Cleo started to get sick. Um, her heart was failing. And upon inquiry, <laughs> Norman Bones was taking credit for it. Um, he said it was her punishment for getting mouthy with him. He wanted the lighthouse, um, and he wanted the Bundys gone, and he wanted something else from Pez. And um, he made it pretty clear, pretty quickly, that he's not just some ordinary guy. In another life, he was a lawyer. Um, 
he was also a serial killer <laughs> um, from years and years and years ago. Um, one who was witnessed publicly executed at gunpoint. He even stabbed the detective who was in charge of his case moments before the firing squad opened fire. <laughs> And then one day, five months ago, I got a text from a number I didn't know saying, all alone, Miss Pendragon, brave. I didn't answer it. I just thought it was some random stalker. I reported it. And then I found out whose number it was. I didn't answer. And then, while at the lighthouse, looking at the lighthouse, he texted me about Tessa, asking how she was, and saying that they were old friends. Um... So they decided to introduce him to me face to face so I would have a face to the name. And the next day I did something extraordinarily stupid. I um I wanted to have a private conversation with him, one that nobody knew about, not Tessa, not Cleo, not Bryce, not the Bundies, none of them. Because it was crazy. Shirley, it's still crazy. I told the story to Jeffy, and he said I sounded insane. And it is insane. It's, it, it's all crazy, and none of it makes sense. And so I wanted to have a talk with him. Because I was seeing things. I was, I was hearing things, but I wasn't seeing things. And so stories were twisting and conflicting, and I... I didn't know what to think at the time, and so I wanted to talk to him. He told me of his childhood, his first kill, why he killed, his purpose. He told me things like his purpose had changed what he wanted. Uh, after that, um, Cleo just got sicker and sicker. Uh, she needed a new heart. So we tried to focus on that. And we got her one. But we learned that um, it didn't matter what we did. <laughs> Replacing the heart just kind of slowed the inevitable. Um, and it just started happening again. Uh, from then on, Norman texts me every now and then. Um, hasn't in a couple months, but we've talked. He's called me. I've seen him in person. Um, I've kind of accepted that he is a part of my life that isn't going to go away. Um, he'll just lie dormant and then I'll have a flare up of the Norman bones. Um, and um, I just keep him at arm's length. I don't give him anything of myself. I. I ask him questions and he answers, but I don't usually answer his questions, truthfully. I started hearing crows everywhere. I'm seeing them more than I used to. In places that I feel like I shouldn't. There's just so many crows. And they're everywhere. 
At first I hated them. I... I blamed them for what was happening. For the suffering that we were all going through. But they're just crows. There's birds. So I went back to treating them with kindness. I would feed them. I would talk to them. I would pet them. I would tell them they were good, pretty birds. And that they were doing a good job. I even tried to do a checkup for one that was hurt. It just burst into flame and ran away. <laughs> I, throughout August, I went to the lighthouse nearly every day. I would check in on it nearly every hour. I started my days there. Because I felt like I needed to protect the Bundys, Cleo, Pez. I felt like I had to protect them. Uh, to a point where it became a sickness. <laughs> and, um... In September, the Bundys decided they wanted to do a, like, final showdown. Um, that I, I did not want a part of. I was going to stay far, far away, and so I stayed home. And then I got an email that I needed to go to the lighthouse. Like, needed to go to the lighthouse. Um, when I did, the lighthouse was smoking rubble. People were fighting with each other. Um, they were upset. <laughs> They're angry. And I was told Cleo was dead and that Norman had won. And that the lighthouse had blown up with her inside of it. Um, he's got this thing. Norman, um. He calls himself death. <laughs> Jesus Christ! I jumped. That one actually scared me. Sorry, I just heard a really loud crow. But, um... He calls himself Death. And he's not the man he used to be. He is an entity. He is a god. He even has a white car. Um, I complimented it once and he said, pale horse and all that. Because <laughs> death rode in on a pale horse. He even has a license plate. It's, it's Crow Dad. <laughs> And he's got this place, um, it's called Purgatory. And he takes your body there when you die. And he leaves you there. I've never been myself, but Rice and Bundy have. They say it's cold. It's foggy, and it's silent. It's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. It's suffering. It's purgatory. And when someone goes there, time runs differently. What is a month for us is a decade for them. Uh, 
uh, he has this thing about deals. Um, he likes chaos, and he likes using people as tools. A life for a life. You kill a target of his choosing or deliver them to your doorstep, and he makes good on something that you want. Whether it's protection for yourself or for someone else or for someone who has gone to purgatory to be returned to you. Rice wanted to make a deal for Cleo. Um, but uh, he wanted proof of life before he made that deal. He wanted to know that Norman actually had him. Or her, rather. So the idiot entered purgatory. <laughs> And unsurprisingly, Norman tricked him and forced him into a deal to get out of purgatory. Not for Cleo. Rice had to kill someone of Norman's choice or Norman would put him back. I have to scroll. I have done everything within my power to keep out of everything after Cleo passed. I, I stopped visiting the lighthouse. I distanced myself from some of the people involved. I ran away at the mention of Norman Bones. I tried to talk people out of it. And then one day I got a call from Flop saying he needed me to come help one of his fathers. Um, when I got there, it was this large gathering of masked people, voices I recognized, people I knew. Uh, Dark, Bob's father, had been poisoned. It was so bad he had to lose a hand. And he didn't recover for a long time. When he was laying in bed, he had this white feather. When I stood next to him, it started to turn gray, and so I thought it was decaying, so I took it from his hand. And it turned black. Um, we gave it to someone else, and it turned white. <laughs> So he gave it back to me and it turned black. And he gave it to someone else and it turned white. It was just white and black and white and black and white and black and white and black over and over and over again. And we tried the next day and it was still white and black and white and black and white and black. It was only black when I held it. It was white when anyone else held it. people were having conversations that just ended in I don't know I don't know what to do and then Norman gave Flop a target and that target was me <laughs> and Flop didn't want to do it so he said no and he gave himself up instead. And then when Norman gave him back, like the next day, he didn't remember me. He didn't remember his fathers, the Bundys, Cleo, even him. He didn't even remember his husband. He didn't even remember his dog. Malto literally sold him his own dog at full price, claiming it was a foster that needed a home. When Flop went to him, Norman texted me saying, 
He really did care about you. I asked if he knew Flop wouldn't do it, and he said he had a feeling. Sometimes he'll text me things like, um, nice view. One time when I was on Gordo, hiking with friends. Sometimes he calls and asks how I'm doing. How I'm holding up. How's Tessa? I've started seeing him everywhere. I saw him on the side of a hill when I was doing a supply run. I see him at the hospital. I saw him driving around. And he also has a brother. Um, had, he had a brother. Um, who's dead now, um, as of uh, two weeks ago. Uh, but this brother also had like an entity thing and he has. And while the body of his brother is missing, people have still seen him. Um, I learned that Bryce wasn't going to do his deal. Basically, his terms were he had to do it without telling anyone. And if he told anyone, they would both die anyway. And he didn't, not only did he not want to do it, he told his target and he told the person close to his target who would suffer for that loss. And I just about lost my mind because I don't think I could live in a world without my boys. <laughs> Jeffy had this dumbass idea of um, marrying Charlie before Bryce died because he wanted his best friend at his wedding. I told him it was a stupid idea. And they broke up for a reason, you know? But during this, um, Norman somehow got Jeffy's number, started texting him, started calling him, because Jeffy has been treating every person that has suffered from Norman. <laughs> Jeffy's kind of been the doctor to fight off his evil, you know? <laughs> And so they talked, um, but they just talked. It, it wasn't even anything inherently dangerous. They just talked. No threats were made. But Charlie decided, I'm gonna go to Norman in spite of everyone telling her not to, in spite of all of the warnings. And she offered herself to Norman Bones in exchange for Bryce and Jeffy. And of course he accepted. So? She threw us a really awkward Friendsgiving dinner where we all called her on her bullshit because we knew what it was. And she went to purgatory. Uh, Norman is cordial. He's very good at words. And he is good at reading people. He knows I am evasive with him, and he's called me out for it. He's complimented how I handle him, says it's smart. He's a psychopath, and yet people flock to him. They want to make deals with him. One of them wanted to have sex with him. Kept posting about it on Twitter. 
is ridiculous. This man is an entity and they're treating him like a sideshow attraction at some kind of traveling freak show circus. He's charged admission at this point. But I have come to accept that no matter how much I try to avoid him, he always comes back. He's like a disease. Uh, in the middle of December, um, a month after Charlie did what she did, I get a call from Quimbley Hayabusa. And I say, hello. And she says, Charlie is alive. To which I said, no. But apparently I was corrected. Someone that I had warned to stay away decided to play Dr. Frankenstein. Roped in Cassandra Silverton. And decided to rip Charlie's soul from purgatory and put it into a synthetic body. We, Bryce, Jeffy, Tessa, and I, um, stay far, far away from her. In fact, we call her Charlie XY. We want nothing to do with her. Uh, Norman has rules and they broke the rules. They took her without making a deal. They took her without asking. And the day of, we could already tell that he was upset because he was following people around who were out looking for Charlie. stay no, I think they left I don't know who that was oh fuck me um uh but yeah, so, um, we kept our distance. We still do. Um, we want nothing to do with her for our own safety. Fast forward to two weeks ago, Jeffy and I are just hanging out, vibing, things are normal. Uh, and he suddenly gets a call to go to an emergency house call. But he has to go alone. He can't even take me. It's the Bundys, so I don't assume he's in danger. I then get a call from Bryce. Who tells me Cleo is back. Apparently Norman just gave her back. No deals. Nothing. Uh, he had texted Bryce earlier in the day. Um, he said something like, uh, I'm sure you've heard about what happened today. Something is owed. You're welcome in advance. We all have theories um, as to why he gave her back. Uh, I have my own theories as well. But she was given back to us and had no idea who any of us are. She was gone for four months. So to her, 
It was decades upon decades upon decades. Like, she remembers being a cop. She remembers working at Roosters. Um, she remembers some of PD. She remembered Tessa. But I don't think she remembers her in the right way. Because she said, have at it. She didn't greet her like she was a friend. Uh, she didn't remember the people who love her most. <laughs> At first, the only people who knew were Lennon, Bundy, Bryce, Jeffy, and myself. Because we didn't know what was happening. And given her history, and also by her own request, we only told select people that she remembered by her request. Um, I told Tessa. Bundy told the other Bundys. And as far as I know, that was it. We only told people she remembered and wanted us to call otherwise. It was decided that she would decide when the city knew she was back. I wanted to talk about it. I wanted to tell people. I wanted to celebrate that someone I cared about was back, but I couldn't talk about her with anyone. Not my mother, not my friends. We wanted to let her control her own narrative. The day after Cleo was returned to us, I woke up and had a massive panic attack. It was so dumb, too. I, I usually tie up my hair before I go to bed because there was so much of it. Um, and it had come loose. It was wrapped around my neck. It was tangled. It felt so heavy. I could feel it. It felt like my skin was crawling at the touch of it. So I, I just went to the bathroom and I just, I just cut it off. I just... I didn't even do it nicely at first. I just I just chopped it. I just one cut. I needed it gone. I it was I mean, I had it fixed because it was a freaking mess, but when Bryce and Jeffy got taken, um I got a phone call about where to find Jeffy. He was by a power plant by the beach. Um, he was in a toga covered in weird markings with his skull bashed tip. And there was so much blood. It was all over me and Dahlia. Sometimes I still see it when I wash my hands. Or when I take a shower. If the water is the wrong temperature, it just it feels like blood. I I wake up in cold sweats because I just I see Jeffy lying there in my arms and I lose him. I lose him every time. And then Bryce. They gave him to Norman the next day. And they talked. Norman thought that... Rice and Jeffy had part of Charlie XY's return and he was upset about it. But when Bryce made it clear that we do not claim her, care about her, or helped her, he just let him go. And then we learned that the person who owned 
the trailer where they were kept. <laughs> they realized that the people who had them One of them was someone I trusted. Someone I cared about. Someone I loved who used to love me. I was his granddaughter. He loved me and then he forgot me. I tried to build up that relationship again just for him to turn around and do this to my boys! My boys! For nothing! With the protection of someone who would hurt the most by this, he claimed he did it for me. For me! Someone he doesn't even remember or care about. Why would he do that? In what world does he think I would be happy about that? He said he's a fall for his club leader. He absolutely is. But he definitely had a hand in it. His phone records are subpoenaed. He... His bank records were subpoenaed. He claims he did this for me, but he doesn't even know who I am. He made a deal with Norman Bones to deliver my voice to him. <laughs> to protect me? There is no protecting me from Norman Bones. It's only a matter of time. I don't see him taking any deals for my safety. <laughs> I just... My boys. <laughs> he hurt my boys. I'm sorry. You have nothing to be sorry for. You are... You are so pure and good and far removed from this and I wanted to keep it that way. Because I didn't want him to sink his claws into you. Or to use you against me. Or against Bryce or Jiffy. Or anyone. I understand that. I just wished. 
that I had heard for the first time that she was around from you, my best friend, other than some stranger I don't know. You have every right to... I hate that he did that. I'm so sorry. It's not your fault. You have no control over what he did. And you don't owe me anything, and you can keep your secrets. But I, I do want to be someone who you can trust wholly. And know that I'll, I'll be here for anything. I'm not like some weak puppy who, who can't handle things. I can take it. And I do want to help in any way I can, even if it is just to help take your mind off of some things or carry some of the burden. I'm not mad at you in any way. I just want to be here for you. And I will say, like, knowing that you guys would mention something or talk about something. It's like you guys were a part of something. And I was just kind of there, clueless. We didn't and I want know you to get for, hurt. I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm just trying to be as honest as I can. Because... I do care immensely about you, Kiki. I do view you as my very best friend. And I will be honest in that. I don't know if it was last week or the week before. I did learn some of this stuff on my own. Because Stephen told me. Because Brooklyn told Stephen. So. Oh my god. I knew about. Norman. I didn't know the scope. I didn't know the whole story. I just knew there was a bad man named Norman and that Cleo was in purgatory. And I didn't tell you because I wanted it to come from you whenever you wanted to tell me if you wanted to tell me. I wasn't going to do anything with the information. I wasn't going to go see Norman. I wasn't going to do anything. I was just going to wait until I heard anything from you. And then last night, I get a phone call from Bolingbrook Penitentiary. And... It happened to happen after learning that Cleo was back from, I don't even remember his name. And it's Balto. He wanted me to come down to the prison and talk to him. So I went and that's when I found out about the truth behind Jeffy and Brass's kidnapping he told me what you said that he he wasn't directly involved but he did give names to someone I don't know he seems to think that he's innocent and I don't know he, it was he a very names, strange he provided vehicles he paid the maintenance fees on the house it was he a very strange alibis. conversation. I didn't want to talk about him. I know. You're going through something that no one should ever even dream about going through. There's a lot, and it seems to be piling up for you. Balto did say that he wanted to talk to you but I said I can pass along the information but I will not promise anything 
But to be transparent with you, I, I didn't know. I appreciate you trying to keep me safe. But the only information I had until Stephen told me anything was stay away from the White House. Okay, I can do that. But if he's as bad and as clever as you say, and he had found me for some reason or whatever, the less information that I had, I feel like I could have gotten myself in trouble if he had tried to do something sneaky with me. So again, I do appreciate trying to protect me, but I feel like having the information and knowing where to go and what not to go and what to be on the lookout for it can be helpful I'm not going to talk about it I'm not going to do anything with it I'm not going to go looking for answers I'm not going to go inserting myself into situations but I do appreciate having the full story I know it must have not been easy for you to rehash everything, or maybe it was to kind of get your thoughts sorted. But I'm not mad at you, Kiki. I adore you, and I'm here for you. Even if it is just to sit in silence and listen to the trees, or if you want to dump all of this information on me, I can take it. I'm, I'm strong. I know you don't like using your friends as therapists, but I'm just a friend who wants to help in any way that I can. I killed my last therapist. <laughs> no, you didn't. That's not on you. How are you? I'm not okay. I haven't been okay for a long time. I... I spend every day looking over my shoulder. Every white car that passes me Every time Norman Adams posts on Twatter, there's like five new Kennets in the city. And there's someone after me who wants to honor serial killers and go after their surviving victims. Keeps posting 911s demanding my email or someone will die, or posting 911s to lure me out places. But I've gotten I've I've gotten used to what those kind of things look like. I, I don't go to them. I And all I do is <laughs> All I do is dress out Tessa. <laughs> She says I'm not a burden, but I feel like nothing but a burden. I'm a tool that can be used against her, and... I had a thought one day of what if I wasn't a tool to use against her anymore, and it scared me. What if I freed her of this burden?
she but wouldn't be with you if she thought you were a burning Kiki. You know that's true. I only know Tessa a tiny bit, but I know if she doesn't want to do something, she do she won't do it. And if she didn't love you and didn't want to be with you, she wouldn't. If she couldn't handle this, if she thought you were a burden, she wouldn't be here. She wouldn't tell you you're not a burden. Those thoughts, you're letting him win. We haven't talked in like two weeks. I mean, last week she was out of town, but... Is it because you're scared? You don't want to open up? No, I did something really dumb. I did something really stupid. She got really mad. And we haven't really talked since then. Well, maybe you guys can set aside Tom. Just to check in with one another. It doesn't have to be some grand conversation. But maybe you guys can set aside a walk where you guys just make sure and check in with one another. I can try. I've been, I've been trying to... I've been trying to get a hold of her to tell her about what happened to Bryce and Jeffy for days, but she's never not busy. I don't even know if she still loves me. She does. That's your know. mind. That is all of your mind, Kiki. You're in a bad place right now. You have a lot going on. You're being pulled in a lot of different directions. And how you're reacting to it is completely normal. There's only so much a person can take. You're very strong. But your mind during this time can jump to a whole lot of crazy scenarios. It can tell you laws and try to sabotage you. It can tell you, hey, if I wasn't here, then it'd be one less person for people to worry about. Or, hey, Maybe I could have prevented this, but all of that is a lie. You make the world a better place, Kiki Pendragon. It would be a far darker world without you in it. And I know I can't speak for everyone, but I can speak for me that my life is better because you are here. I know it's hard in these times to focus on good things. But, although you don't understand why, Cleo is back. She's here. Jeffy is safe. He's here. Ross is safe. He's here. Tessa is safe. She's here. 
you're still here. You have to focus on that. There are evil, evil people in this world. There will always be evil people in this world who try to take good things away. And you can either give them that attention and spiral, or you could try to focus on the good, stay safe, I am sorry that you are going through all of this. No one should ever have to. But you are going to be okay. And Tessa loves you. Gotta take it one, one day at a time. One step at a time. I'm so sorry. There's nothing for you to apologize for. Again, I'm not mad. In the slightest. I was confused. What, what the fuck? And I was worried. That Why I wasn't did the camera change? Friend. At what? least in the same Who? way that I view you as my best friend. Why did my camera change? Did something... But I was never mad. Did something get in front of my camera to move it? I don't like that. I don't like that at all. So you have nothing to apologize for. None of this is your fault. Absolutely none of it. You didn't create Norman. You didn't create this darkness. That's all. You put all of that blame on him. Okay? You are good. Absolutely none of this is your fault. Okay? Always a text, a phone call, an email, a letter, a carrier pigeon away. <laughs> I'll send a crow. Perfect. <laughs> Can someone Thank do a shout out for Ray real quick? I don't want to tab out. And open it up. And letting me sit here with you and try to help, okay? Go send her crows. Sweet little crows. Mm deep breath <laughs> can you name hmm three things that you hear right now 
plane. The trees. Crickets. How about two things that you can feel? My hair. Um, the floor. Four things that you can see. Um, uh, my sh my shoes. Um, your shoes. Henry. A sleeping bag. Who's Henry? The skull. Oh, he named the skull? Yeah, it showed up one day, so I felt like it needed a name, so I called it okay. Henry. <laughs> uh, the light bulb. Okay. Deep breath. <laughs> You'll get through it. And you have people who will help you. If it's any constellation, you know you're not alone. Sometimes I just want to be, but I feel like I can't. Because the moment I am, he'll get me, or this person looking for me to honor Kenneth will get me, or or some block will get me, or or I'll I'll get myself. Sometimes I I worry about what I would do if I was alone, but sometimes I just want to be alone, but I don't feel like I can be alone, and it gets so overwhelming being pulled everywhere, having people check on me all the time. Sometimes I, I just, I just want to, sometimes I just want a moment to breathe, and I have not had that moment in so long. It's just constant phone calls and constant texts and people running up to me and and saying we're gonna hang out because I want to make sure you're okay. But sometimes I just want to sit in a corner. Please just let me sit in a corner for five minutes without checking on me. You are loved. You are loved. Maybe you can communicate that to people. You're only one person. No one expects you to be in every place all at once. If you need Tom, and they truly love and care about you, and you say, hey, I just need a moment. Can you give me a moment? I'm safe, I'm okay. I'm gonna be here. I just need a moment. I just feel so bad because I know why they're asking. They care, I know they do, but I just, I feel like an awful person if I go, please just leave me alone. I 
think they would understand. I know I would. And again, maybe it's not, hey, leave me alone. Maybe it's, hey, I need some time with my thoughts. I'll contact you when I'm ready. I just need this time to myself. Everyone needs and everyone deserves that time. I get too much of it sometimes. To where I befriend a flag in a golf course. But if they truly love and care about you, they wouldn't get mad at you asking for Tom to yourself. Maybe that's the first step. You setting boundaries for yourself. It's okay to say no. It's okay to put yourself first sometimes. I know it's hard. You're a very giving person. I have tr trouble with it as well. But it could help. And if you ever want company, but you also want to be alone. Steven has a say in a block. We went to separate schools together. We could go take a boat ride. And I don't have to say a single thing. We could just drive around the island. Or we could go to the golf course and play golf separately to where you have something to occupy your mind but you don't actually have to think and you can just be I'm always willing to sit in silence with you okay I don't deserve you. <laughs> You're right. You deserve so much better. <laughs> You're gonna get through it. One day at a time. That's all you can do. Get up every day and choose to, d to try. You have to choose it. Every day. You can be cheesy and you can look in the mirror and be like, Hey, Kiki, you're awesome. <laughs> you're going to get through this day. Put up sticky notes. Jonathan made me um, he made me make a thing in my phone um, titled read this <laughs> and it just says <laughs> it just says the people who matter know I'm not at fault over and over and over and over and over again <laughs> It's been a while since I read it. <laughs> well, then start. Make it a daily routine. Oh, God! <laughs> what? Oh, God. What, 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 what? Oh, God. 
He's <laughs> Breathe. Where is he? Where is he? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Do you want to get out of here? I don't want to be here anymore. I can't. Okay. You flew here. Where I is didn't. I where didn't. is it? It's over here. <laughs> oh that little shit. Oh. Oh. oh I didn't even oh that was perfect. I didn't even see that because of the of the HUD. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god, that was so good. <laughs> oh my god. No one's behind her. Do you want to fly? No, no, no. I, my hands are shaking too much. I, I can't, I can't. Oh, why am I in the back? Oh my god. Oh, she's not even gonna answer. She's too freaked out. Oh my god. He said first name and everything. Did he get used to saying Kiki on Ziggy? Or is that on purpose? Oh. Oh my god, I'm out of tissues. I needed tissues for that. Norman's gonna kill Loki. <laughs> Could you imagine Norman Bones riding around on Kiki's motorcycle? <laughs> Anywhere you wanna go. I just, I just wanted to be away from there. Okay. I don't, I don't care. Is there anywhere you wanna, or anyone you wanna see? Jeffy. You want to call him? He 
he's at the hospital. You can't land there, but um, um, you can land nearby. Yeah, I have my my car parked here. We can go take it. Okay. Unless you want to continue to fly, and then we can fly. No, no, no. It's it's fine. It's fine. Come to work and he rolls up with your motorcycle just to give it back to you. Oh my god, could you imagine? 